Welcome to Pressure Point. I'm Brad Newcomb. Ruling in the landmark case involving the Gitsan, Witsuwitan land claims, Chief Justice Alan McEachern of the BC Supreme Court dismissed the existence of Aboriginal rights, saying that they had been extinguished when the Crown began settling BC. The Gitsan, Witsuwitan people have claimed the right to the land because their ancestors have used it for thousands of years. With me are Jim Angus, Hereditary Chief, Gitsan in Kispiox, and Alvin Dixon, Conference Minister, Native Ministries for the United Church of Canada. And Jim is also the current president of BC Conference in the United Church of Canada. Welcome both Jim and Alvin. Oh, thank you. Prior to this judgment, it was said by one of the counsel for the Gitsan that this was a search for the legal pathways to justice for Native people. Since then, the judge, since the judgment came down, it's been described as a four-lane freeway to Oka, right across BC. How would you respond to that claim, Jim? I, I think that I would respond in a fashion that I, uh, my first message to our people is that uh, violence is not the answer. Um, there are means and ways of dealing with 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 the particular issue and. Uh, Violence certainly isn't one of them. Uh, we may have to resort to civil disobedience, but violence is not the answer. Now, one of the startling things, and I think the very shocking things in this judgment, if you if you read it carefully, is some of the language that is used. Uh, Native society is described as primitive. Uh, it is said that the rights of Natives were lawfully extinguished. They don't say by whose law, uh, but by the Crown that life was nasty, brutish, and short, and so on. Does it feel like a death sentence on Native culture, Alvin? I think it does. Uh, he also talks about uh, Indians uh, having had many opportunities to, to get into the mainstream of life, and, and, and his whole uh, judgment reflects the kind of thinking that went into the white paper policy of 69 getting the uh, Indians into the mainstream. It does uh, um, smack of uh, genocide, I think, very strongly, I feel that. Uh, does it not feel like the sort of dark uh, shadow of colonialism has sort of been cast over the, the whole country, so to speak? Or have we, has it ever left? Well, I thought, we, I thought it was gone. But he has reintroduced it in a very strong way. Like the, the language he uses about our Indians and how they should assimilate and, and, and uh, do things the way the ordinary people do things. You know, it's just, it's appalling that, you know, somebody can uh, get us back into that kind of uh, thinking, you know. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I wondered about in reading it, he says that the, your Aboriginal rights to the land were extinguished, and yet, no treaty or statute was signed. How can that be? I mean, is that not illogical? Well, for, for us, I think we have uh, watched uh, our history uh, in the courts, uh, and, and we were becoming more and more encouraged as the Supreme Court of Canada came down with decision after decision in favor of the Indians. And then he comes along and dismisses those, too. And he not only dismisses our Aboriginal title, he dismisses a whole lot of things that the Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Court of Canada have already decided. He, take, he takes a very different approach to the, the whole notion of, of land and ownership of land. And I know that central to the whole uh, debate was a, an understanding, a native understanding of land. Can you say a little bit about what is that connection to the land? Well, our, our people are very different uh, with the way we look at the land compared to um, the society uh, in general. Um, we look at the land as being part of the land. Spiritually, we are part of the land. What, uh, a good comment, I think, that caps all of that is, when you hurt the land, I cry. And I think that's, that statement has been said numerous times. Um, we we uh, practice and uh, our law over the land through the fee system. And we do, as far as we know, we. We, were, we, we have jurisdiction and authority over land. We do control the land, and each portion of the land that we are claiming uh, is our land. 
and it's 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 ownership and jurisdiction. When we talk about ownership and, jur ownership and jurisdiction, we talk about the areas that we that we own. We have, we can describe which has been which was done through the courts. They uh, spent a number of years talking about ownership and jurisdiction in the courts, uh, telling the, the the governments and the courts that we own the land. We described it. We give the geographical explanation of it and uh, how we, we own the land. And through the fee system, we, when a chief passes on, we, um, the name has uh, always stays with a portion of the land. That never changes. When we alist, which is my name, uh, the original realist or the realist previous to me died, I stepped into that name as Jim Angus and I became realist. But realist was always realist that owned a particular portion of land. And through the fee system, when I became chief and took the name we alist, uh, I had to spend quite a bit of dollars and, and resources, use up a lot of resources to, to practice part of the fee system, so in that I am taking over the power to run and control the land. And uh, with that, uh, as part of the thing, and not only that, we control the land, we control the resources, and especially the fishing, and the particular areas uh, that we touch on when we hunt. Have you seen any signs, I mean, obviously this, this judgment doesn't give any indication, but have you seen signs of, of people, non-natives, beginning to sort of get a glimpse of this understanding of the land? Oh, I believe so. I'm, I'm uh, one of the particular people that thoroughly uh, that, that listened to this for three years is uh, the judge himself. And uh, he was getting to the point of saying the names of the creeks and the mountains and the springs and the names of the chiefs. He was very familiar with these things. And uh, and then when he came down with the judgment, I was just shocked. You were shocked? I was shocked. You never expected somebody. anything like this? I, I certainly expected some movement, uh, but not a total denial. I've read that even government and business uh, leaders, I mean, the, even those that wouldn't have wanted uh, Native land claims uh, to go to the side of the natives were shocked. Well, I believe everybody was shocked. I, I've uh, I've been around uh, in different areas of the country and, and have connections with different people, and uh, uh, even the reaction of the forestry people and s some of the people that are in the industry, uh, they were quite cautious of how they were that their reaction, especially the immediate reaction after the judgment on Friday and Saturday that weekend, and. You couldn't help but read into it that uh, they were very careful of what they said. There's a feeling, I, I mean, it feels looking at it that somehow we're entering a time when there's a danger that what is legal is going to be different than what is really just and moral. In a sense, uh, the law is almost divorced from justice. Is that a fair, is that, would that be how you would feel in this judgment? I think Jimmy has a story about his perception of. Uh, justice and, and what is fair in relation to your uh, niece, I think it might be appropriate sure. to talk about that. Yeah. Well, I, when I was uh, being brought up, my father always talks about justice. It's justice is justice. The law is the law is the law. And uh, as I've uh, watched it over the past 20 years or so, uh, my faith in that particular kind of a statement has, has been lost along the way. I, through my experience with the court system. Uh, I had a niece that was uh, murdered two years ago. I sat in court for five weeks and uh, labored over what was going on and what was being said in the court system. And uh, at the end of it all, the man that murdered my niece got four years in jail, meaning that he likely will be in the streets in two years' time. And uh, I don't think that's justice and, and so on. It goes on and on and on. There's a lot of different things that that have been reflected uh, over my years that where I see justice is not really justice. Justice is money talks. Uh, it's, it's, it's so unfair. Is your patience wearing thin? Well, personally, yes, my patience has worn thin, but I, I, uh, I need to say that uh, our Native people in this country, especially the Gitsan people, have been saying and have said even since the, the judgment came down that we have waited 100, 150 years. We could certainly be patient for a little while longer. Does that kind of patience, because I mean, I, I'm an impatient person and I, I can't imagine going through the 
long court battles and, 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 and the whole history of horrible oppression and still being able to, to try to find the patience in me. Is that part of the tradition that you come from? It's certainly part of the teaching that our elders have uh, uh, incorporated into you know, our, our, our lifestyle. Uh, certainly, uh, they have, uh, over the years, viewed the visitors as particularly very ignorant when it comes to uh, walking this land and, and, and you know, exploiting this, this vast amount of resources that we have. You know. And um, it's always, it's always uh, a point that elders make, be very, very patient with those people. You know and be helpful. I think, and, and uh, I guess we, as we look at Jim and I, in, at our particular age, I guess we haven't been saying that to the younger kids because they don't have that same kind of attitude that we were raised with, you know. And I think this is where the danger is. The younger people will not have the same kind of patience that people of my generation and older have. How much is that a part of assimilation? I think a great deal of it has to do with the kind of exposure that we've had. And we, I mean, we talked about residential schools. Um, we were removed, many of us, from those elders, from those families, from those villages, and placed in residential schools. I went from Bella Bella to Port Alberni for eight years and never saw my mother or father for ten months of the year never saw an Indian elder and um, was taught that my language was not of any use to me anymore, so I should forget it. You know? And there was a whole history of that kind of thing. Um, the potlatch was legislated against. You know? There was a law against that. There was a law against people assembling to talk about land claims for years and years. Uh, there's <laughs> all kinds of laws that have been passed that have been designed to assimilate Indian people and to uh, move them away from their culture and their language. In your opinion, are those laws were those laws based in racism? Very definitely, uh, uh, very definitely, it was uh, an attitude. I mean, I, I grew up in uh, in a fish plant where they had, and you think we were talking about the deep south. I grew up in a fish plant, and I I'm. Uh, old enough to remember washroom signs that said natives and whites, you know, and this went into the 50s here in Canada, you know. So um, when McEachern talks about Indians having had many opportunities to move into the mainstream, those laws and those racist actions against us have denied the very thing he talks about, allowing us to move into some form of equality with the people that arrived, you know, on our scene in the in the last hundred years. So. How willing are Canadians to look at that? You, that that uh, racist heritage and that racist presence, not just heritage. I mean, it's a, it. it it's I, I I in my experience working in the church and working in our school system, I find people more willing to look at the Cornavacas, the Guatemalas. Mm -hmm. than they are to looking at the Kispioxes and the Waglislas and the Squamishes and the Musqueams. They pretend it's not there mm -hmm. half the time. So I, I think they're very unwilling to look at that. It's more comfortable to talk about Cuernavaca, mm -hmm. you know, Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. No, It's more comfortable to talk about that because it's sort of <laughs> like... Well, it's safer. It's more removed. I mean... They don't have to change. That's they right. can talk about it and view it from a distance. Mm -hmm. But if they started to look at the Kispe Ox and started to look at the Musqueam and started to get to know us better, it might be so that they could become to like us, and if they begin to like us, then they would have to change. And I don't think they want to do that, many of them. You both uh, are very active in the United Church of Canada. What is the United Church of Canada doing? The United Church of Canada, I think, is has recognized that there needs to be awareness of Native people. I think they've recognized the injustices that has been happening or have been happening with Native people in this country. Um, 
there needs to be a lot of awareness that has to happen with, with Native people. I think the society in general needs to know and understand uh, about Native people. The, the whole thing that I talked about a little earlier with respect to the fee system and the government that we have over the land um, needs to be known. I, peop I believe people need to understand that. Um, one of the steps or one of the things I'd like to see happen in this country is uh, our curriculum uh, in the schools need to be developed so that it includes Native people, the history of Native people. Uh, all too few people know uh, when do the Indian people start to vote? What are reservations? How do we fit into the constitution of this country? So questions like that need to be answered and, and awareness and education of, of the culture of, of, of Native people, the richness that is there that needs to be shared with the rest of this country I think needs to happen. Just in continuation of that, Jim, one of the things that is going to be happening in 1992 is, is the there'll be a celebration of the 500th anniversary of Christopher Columbus arriving uh, in North America. And it's often referred to in, in history textbooks as discovering North America. What would you say, either one of you two, to that kind of celebration? Well, I'm very pleased that we were discovered uh, after we've existed here mm -hmm. for hundreds and thousands of years that we were discovered. That and I think that, again, uh, only reflects the attitude of people, that Indian people were discovered when the, the, the non-Native people came here to this country. Uh, we went through a court system just recently where the laws of the land made a decision as to with respect to our Aboriginal rights. And I think there needs to be more to that. I need to, we need to more need to go b uh, around that law and talk about what, how we existed and what our rights are and how long we've been practicing our rights in this country. So in a sense that phrase that, you know, Columbus discovered America is, is kind of the foundation of McEachern's judgment, isn't it? Oh, well, certainly. Mean, it's that same uh, notion. I, I think it is, and uh, I just want to go back to your question about the United Church involvement. I think the United Church has come a long way. Having been a party to those laws that banned potlatches and having been a party in running residential schools, I think the United Church has come a long way. And. Um, the apology the United Church made in Sudbury, I think, has done a lot to free up a lot of Indian people. And uh, the more specific things that the United Church is doing is uh, working on this question of creating awareness among non-Native people as to what Indian land claims are about, and also making a commitment to help Indian people in their court actions by contributing significant dollars to court actions that the Gitsanwetsoten and other Indian groups might take to correct this injustice that uh, has been with us too long, really. What about uh, other Native groups across the country? What has their reaction and, and expression of support been uh, to the Gitsanwetsoten people since this judgment? Most of the reaction I've heard has been total support. Uh, encouragement to appeal the whole judgment, uh, not only that, but take it right to the Canada Pre uh, Supreme Court. And I think that you will see um, the Native people of this country will pull together and really work together. And uh, I think uh, if, if you're looking at the positive, what, what's positive about the judgment that came down, that will be one of the positive things. It will pull our Native people together and also uh, it's already been shown uh, in the church that that uh, there are more and more people are stepping forward and supporting the whole idea of dealing with land claims. Is it when you say more and more people in the church, that's native and non-native? That's right. Yes, oh. I, I I think that uh, it's not only that. I, I was at a meeting the other day uh, of uh, church leaders here in BC, and uh, there they have uh, put together a statement. Uh, as a reaction to the judgment and uh, uh, with total support to deal with land claims and support what the Native people are doing. And that was an ecumenical group? An ecumenical, ecumenical group. Ecumenical church That's leaders. Um, what about the population at large? It's a pretty secular community here in BC. Is the same level of support there? I travel the province quite a bit with, with my position and uh, I've, uh, I've seen where a lot of people have come forward and said, yes, we need to deal with it. We need to rally behind what is going on. Uh, Alvin has certainly traveled the province a lot, too, and uh, I believe he's seen a lot of that. 
Not only that, I listen to some of the open mouth shows and uh, on radio, and I hear a lot of people who wouldn't ordinarily express an opinion, you know, and who wouldn't ordinarily be supportive of Native people coming out and saying, you know, this has gone too far. We can't sit by and watch this. So they are speaking out, and, and they are starting to pay attention. And if you look at the action that the provincial government is making, I think they're, they're hearing what McEachern does say, but even though he dismisses the claim, he forced by that action the government to recognize that they have an obligation to negotiate. And I, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, pressure, not just on the government, but on Indian people too, to look at what needs to happen in the way of negotiations. And all across the country, when you ask the question about I Indian support across the country, I think everybody recognizes that it has to be a political uh, resolution rather than a legal. A legal resolution would be too clean. Which is no. what he says in his judgment, yeah. isn't it? It's not a legal issue. It's yeah. a socio-economic, uh, political. Yeah. So what would you like to see uh, on, on those, in those discussions? I mean, what are some of the things you'd like to see? Certainly, I would want to see uh, uh, a quicker uh, time frame uh, whereby several groups could be negotiating with government n rather than just the isolated few uh, like the Nishka have been at it for, I don't know how many tens of years, you know, how many decades they've been at it, you know, and, and they're no, they're just going to sign a, a frame. I don't know how many framework agreements they've signed in the last five years, and they're going to do it again on on Wednesday, you know, still talking framework. So, I think uh, politicians uh, need to recognize that uh, the sooner. They act, the less cost. I mean, their biggest fear, I think, has been cost. And the longer they put it off, the greater the cost is going to be. You know, so I think they need to accelerate the process of negotiations and get more people involved. Do you have faith in, 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 in the goodwill of those kinds of negotiations? Or does the negotiation process itself sometimes become a stalling tactic? Well, there certainly has to be some faith, and I believe that the governments, uh, federal and provincial, need to sit down and, and, and bargain in good faith. But I believe the, the key and one of the first things that the federal government needs to do is change their policy with respect to negotiation of land claims. They did make a movement with that policy in 1986, but that policy didn't move far enough. It needs to be changed and uh, to get away from that uh, that particular policy uh, related to the Aboriginal rights. They, they, they want us to extinguish Aboriginal rights before we even sit down and discuss land claims. And that's a policy in the federal government that the federal government has needs to be changed. So what do you do in the process while you're waiting? I mean, what do you do? Well, certainly one of the things that, is, uh, that works the best is, is lobbying and, and making people more aware of who we are and what we are and what we're wanting. I believe that education of the general public is one of the most important things and getting people to support us and we have been getting a lot of support from the churches and we're very thankful for that. The, the movie uh, Dances with Wolves, one of the most popular of 1990, it's still very very popular, uh, does something like that, I mean and, and, and people are moved by it, I mean they have some kind of a, an emotional experience and it, I think it rings true that there's been injustice against Native people and the Native side of the story hasn't been heard. Does something as simple as that help, and does that translate into further action by people, or do people just tend to become emotional and, and leave? I think it certainly helps uh, people understand the local situation better, having been exposed to something like Dances with Wolves, because it does a terrific job uh, in terms of detailing you know, the kind of injustice that we have faced throughout our history, even to this day. You know, um, I think one of the things that has to happen uh, is uh, Indian people have got to become more uh, aggressive in, in getting their message to the average people, you know, the 
so-called grassroots people, getting, getting to the people in the community, getting to people in the schools about what it is that they're concerned about. No, no. There's a lot of environmentalists out there who share the same kind of concerns we have. We need to, you know, work in concert with those people and getting our concerns across, because they understand the same things we do, maybe from a different perspective, but they certainly understand. So I think we have to take that aggression and, and, and get our people, you know, into non-Indian communities as well, mm -hmm. as inviting non-Indian people to come into our communities and, and share time with us and, and share stories with us and share experiences with us. So does that then become like a cross-cultural program? Very definitely. Uh, which is something that we in the United Church have been involved in for some time, uh, particularly with respect to our work with Native communities and, and, uh, and in terms of training people in the way of community and, and uh, leadership in congregations and stuff like that. So I suppose then also programs like the law, Native Law Program and uh, education. UBC there's, and so on? Well, there's a Native Law program, there's a Native Indian Teacher program, there's a Native Nursing program, and we in the United Church are developing a Native Ministry program in concert with uh, the Diocese of Caledonia, Anglican people, Vancouver School of Theology. A and that's moving very quickly to a point where the school is running a, a Master of Divinity program by extension, which is strictly for Native ministry, and it's not unlike the law program or the Native Indian teacher training program. How long does it take to heal uh, the, the hurt, though, from a, a judgment like Ellen McEachern's? I mean, d are you able to sort of carry on, or does it feel like a, uh, something that knocks you down? It certainly knocks you down, but I, uh, I think I, I said it at the beginning that Native people are very patient people. Our chiefs have a, a, a very broad scope with life and a very broad scope with respect to the politics of life. And I think that we would take that judgment and use it on, uh, as positively as we can. And uh, one of the things that judgment that will do, as I said earlier, was it's going to pull our people together. And uh, Native people are very patient people, so uh, I think it will also make us dig our heels in and work even harder and be better organized. And uh, in the end, we'll succeed. The pain never, ever goes away, I don't think. It, there's just too many of those kind of judgments about Indian people. So you, you know? simply live with it? You just simply live with it and use that pain, I guess, to, to, go, forward. to go forward. Alvin Dixon, Jim Angus, uh, from the United Church of Canada, thank you both for being with me this evening. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for being with us on Pressure Point. I've been speaking with Alvin Dixon and Jim Angus. I'm Brad Newcomb.